What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the channel for an interview I know many of you are looking forward to. I am the director of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey right now, Reese Frake Waterfield. Dude, congratulations on the movie and this like wild and somewhat unprecedented ride it has taken you on. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been so exciting. We've um, Yesterday was the day we've released to the world. So, <laughs> like, it's approximately in 4,000 screens or so, which is absolutely wild. I had the pleasure of seeing it on one of those screens with a very enthusiastic audience. And I know that usually you don't release your films theatrically, but this film to me feels like it's got perfect, uh, you know, midnight communal horror loving vibes where everyone is there and they know what they're getting into. Yeah, so we kind of... Um made this like normally our our business model we did a lot of like straight to vod um and dvd films at the start um and but since then we've started to like up the quality and make them kind of better and more kind of like action-packed um and now yeah we're starting to get interest with some of these films for like theaters like i thought winnie the pooh had the potential to um go to do a small theatrical run but it's just gone blown way out of proportion <laughs> it's not a small run at all <laughs> Apparently, when you put a knife in Winnie the Pooh's hands, it just it brings the viewers in. It, br it brings the audience. <laughs> Who would have thought? Um, I want to learn a little bit about you as a filmmaker before we jump into the specifics here. So looking at your IMDb, I saw you made a couple shorts in 2014, but then there was nothing until 2021. And at that point, you produced something like seven features. And it seems like you're producing more and more ever since. So what happened between 2014 and 2021 that put you on that track? So um, actually, I used to be in a completely different industry. So uh, I used to work in corporate strategy for like a big multinational energy company. Um, they were called EDF Energy. So um, I think you guys have them in the US. Um, and so I did that for about eight or nine years. Um, and kind of my my partner was um, kind of in the film industry. So I kind of like through osmosis started learning about it and, and getting more and more interested in it. And then, yeah, approximately about two years ago, I just thought, oh, I'm just going to give it a go. Um, I just quit my job and then just started doing it. And yeah, those, those films on IMDb, they're actually it's actually even more mad than that because they were um a lot of them have been like they're just waiting and they're in like the post-production pipeline so they've already been filmed and we're just kind of doing the last minute tweaks before they can get released but in those two years alone i think i might have produced about 40 or 50 feature films all of which um yeah have got kind of worldwide distribution and then since then we, it's now yeah it's a bit more quality focused now reducing down the number so i'm doing about or well, probably producing about four this year um winnie was one last year i've got winnie two we've got bambi we've got peter pan and a secret project <laughs> I have produced one feature film in the horror genre, and I'll tell you, I I think I needed to sleep for like a whole month after shooting that movie, so I am so incredibly impressed that you can do this nonstop. It really is something else. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, a lot of people call these um, productions like heart attack productions, at least for like the producers, because like you're constantly manically going from one set to the next and you're having to wear a lot of hats so like it was like that on Winnie actually I was um that's why I'm kind of like the producer writer director I did like drones on the set as well and like VFX supervising just yeah hands in loads of pots so <laughs> All right, I have some. I have a bunch of questions here about the uh, the micro budget horror filmmaking structure because, like, I'm steeped in this industry twenty four seven. I do love to focus on horror, but I feel like that's a corner of the business that I don't know. It's it's shrouded in more mystery to me than I ever realized it was. So, a couple questions on that. I believe this is um, ITN's first theatrical release. So, can you kind of walk us through? When a movie you're making is not going to the big screen, where do those movies actually go? How do, can people see those? Yeah, so all the other ones, they um, essentially, the the model, we make them, we're like the filmmakers um, and we're from the UK. 
and then ITN are our kind of US partners. Um, we hand the film over to those guys and then they handle the, the worldwide distribution of it. And normally that includes kind of straight to DVD. So for example, Walmart, a lot of these will be in Walmart superstores. Um, and then you've got all the foreign sales as well. So they'll sell it to loads of different foreign territories. Um, and then you've got the VOD element. So streaming online. So, and then all of that compiles together to help generate some profit. Okay. So, so speaking <laughs> of the profit, I'm, I'm going to stop myself short of asking for like specific numbers here, but I am curious uh, what your barometer is in terms of how, do, how you guys figure out that something is successful. I guess more so than anything, I'm trying to wrap my head around, you know, how many viewers you guys like to reach compared to the more traditionally uh, released horror movies that, you know, we're kind of used to assessing via box office and and other uh other data like that yeah so we we don't really get viewing numbers because all that really happens is you know like we'll make the film hand it over to them and then those guys they're just in charge of basically met, trying to make as much money as they can uh from it so we don't have massive visibility around the kind of quantity of people it's been exposed to however like it is in the millions um, it goes to and it goes to loads of different territories. Um, so we're always getting people messaging us about it. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, it is quite it is quite far reaching. It's just not got that theatrical component at the start. Um, but everything else is probably very similar to what it is in a normal kind of filming structure. But just less on that. Fascinated by all this. Um, speaking speaking of things like like VOD and streaming, and do correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I believe I read somewhere that after the images and the trailer went viral, you guys did get some interest from studios and streaming services. So why not go that route and instead stick with I believe it's Fathom and and the way that you're distributing the movie now. Yeah, so there was a few. There was a discussion we had with the distributor about that because, yeah, one option was we had some very large companies, um, some of the biggest you can probably imagine, message us and ask just to buy it outright um, and take over all the rights. But we thought, okay, that's it. It wasn't for a huge amount, um, and we thought the film had a lot of potential. Um, so we thought we will start off with a theatrical route see how that does um, and then we'll look more towards kind of our traditional model after which is like the DVD the VOD um, element there but since those offers it's just continued to get bigger and bigger and bigger um, after the steals after the trailer um, every every week it's just been like growing in size which is yeah mad <laughs> and it got culminated in it being the second most anticipated film this year so I'm glad we didn't just hand it over to someone. <laughs> yeah, ultimately a smart move right there. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I am curious, did anything about the movie change after everything went viral? Was there anything about the viral response that made you want to go back and, and alter or enhance anything that people were kind of gravitating towards? Yeah, so we had quite um, a limited amount of resources and budget for the um, the principal photography. So the intention at the start was you know make it as good as possible um i thought it would have a small theatrical run but then as soon as the still started going online it got bigger and bigger and bigger and then that's when we had this moment when oh my god be better um like there's going to be a lot of people watching this <laughs> so we need to make this as good as we can and then that's when we got some more kind of money and resources coming in and then we did some reshoots and added a load of more fun scenes and made it quite kind of action driven really because I really wanted the fact that I really wanted it to be so when you went to see a Winnie the Pooh horror film you see a lot of Winnie the Pooh I didn't want him to just be in the film for like 20 or 25 minutes which is probably what it would have been if it was left to the principal photography so uh, now he's in like I think he's in like 50 minutes of the movie something crazy <laughs> you do see a lot i can confirm that um <laughs> backtracking even more what would you say is the biggest difference between how you originally conceived this idea playing out like day one when the idea first crossed your mind and what we actually see in the finished film screening in theaters now yeah so one of the biggest changes was when you're producing these films you have to take um comments from like some other some of the other execs and take everyone's criticism on board and uh, suggestions so we did that and it became a bit of a um a kind of 
less focused on Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh and more kind of a typical kind of cabin in the woods kind of slasher route then once it kind of started to go really viral um I really wanted there to be to really strengthen the relationship between Christopher and Pooh and integrate that more into the story because for me that's like that's basically what the story is it's Christopher's and Pooh's relationship I didn't want it to be limited to one part of the film um, so that's why you now see him featured throughout uh, all of those scenes were basically reshoot, reshoots or additional photography I should say not reshoots yeah <laughs> Oh, that's very interesting, especially because that is something that is threaded through the entirety of the film. Yeah. <laughs> um, for for anyone else out there who wants to make a horror movie on a micro budget, is there any like, I, I guess like a number one do and number one don't in terms of how to figure out how to best use and maximize such a small budget? Yeah, I'd say like the most important thing is the the concept and the the hook straight away that needs to be really strong um, because that's the first thing people are going to see it's also what your distributors are going to rely on to to actually sell the film so if it's something really weak and it's just i don't know they're like a, a random witch film or like a zombie film there's a lot of those floating around they're not unique there's um they, they've probably got like five other people pitching them try and come up with concepts which really stand out and ideally yeah if you can draw on elements like the public domain and there's other ways of doing this outside of it just being public domain too which um you can like link towards your story because that will have a really um strong that's a really strong ip and it's a really good resource for them for marketing um, and it will really and that will ultimately help that when the product's on the actual shelf in like a store like Walmart or so people will look at go oh I know that nursery rhyme I know that fable um, and I haven't seen that concept before so I'm more interested in buying it now uh, rather than it just being a low budget zombie film. You bring up uh, the public domain and I I'm curious about where you cross the line in that respect even if something is in the public domain when it comes to winnie the pooh in particular can you give us an example of something you needed to kind of keep in check to adhere to what you were actually allowed to use versus stepping over that line and you know jumping into what maybe another studio has ownership of right now yeah so yeah we had to be very careful i had to be very careful when i was doing this so i looked at the um 1926 book and only read that as my reference essentially and then just drew it went off on tangents and just got inspired by that um because anything which was created post then is still under the copyright of disney um so for example you've got tigger um he wasn't allowed to be in it um the way Pooh speaks as well like that's obviously not in the book um and that sort of tone which everyone links to Winnie the Pooh is um is their is their copyright really like that's their kind of branding with him so I couldn't use that I couldn't use phrases like oh bother I couldn't put the red t-shirt on him so there are a lot of these elements where you just need to be really really careful with because if you make a mistake there and you make the film and if I had accidentally got hit put Tigger in the film or got him to say oh bother a lot I would be really encroaching on their their copyright and their branding then and then that would have probably caused a lot of issues with uh, with getting this released. Oh, I have so many questions that I think are teetering into spoilers. We're going to get there. But before I put up the spoiler warning for everyone, I'm just curious for you as a filmmaker, let's say you could put a horror spin on any other IP out there and public domain was not an issue. You could have your pick of anything you wanted. What would you pick? I've really been excited by Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles lately because I think they're like, they're really like the, the story has a very kind of horrifying undertone anyway because it's these these half human half turtles who live in the sewer who have a kind of rat king who they follow and then they come out of the sewer with weapons and <laughs> and it all just like it all just starts to link together to me so um i'd love i'd love to do that i'd love to have them like down the alleyway cutting people up feeding them to their rat king on pizza or something so yeah, I hope I can get the copyrights from that, but I don't know if I can. <laughs> and Teletubbies. I'm never going to unsee these visions. Oh my God, dude. Yes, I want to do Teletubbies too. <laughs> 
I want to see both of these so badly. <laughs> those, are, those are genius ideas. All right. I'm going to do it. I'm going to put up a spoiler warning for our viewers right now. If you have not seen Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, go seek it out. You push pause on this video. And then after you've seen the movie, you come right back to it and push play. And it begins right here. It is that easy. All right. This is it. One and only spoiler warning. Um... Okay, my first question, and I know you've answered this to an extent before, but I'm curious, like the detail and, and kind of like the Bible of, you know, what Pooh and Piglet are. So I, I guess for clarity's sake here, they they are not human beings in masks, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, and that's what a lot of people really wanted, like when they first got excited by it, um, there was a lot of comments out there saying, oh, this isn't just like, I don't know, like your necks or so, where it's some killers who have put on the put on the mask and then doing a home invasion. No, this is actually Winnie the Pooh and Piglet going around killing people. So, <laughs> and that's what's so exciting about it. It's so different. Uh, yeah. So, in in your mind, what exactly are they? <laughs> like, are are they some sort of like humanoid, uh, like bear human mashup type thing? Like, what what is on their insides? I'll yeah. take any little detail you have. <laughs> so yeah, they're kind of I hate this word, and I might not be able to say it, anthropomorphic. Um, basically, half hybrids, like half bear, half man, and half pig, half bear. So that was a decision because I really wanted them to have the ability to like hold weapons so if i made winnie the pooh just a bear he's got paws all he'll do is go around s swiping people and killing them maybe biting them so um but with hand it becomes so much more fun because he has weapons he can drive a car i can do all these really interesting things um and yeah inside they they are a mix of kind of you know human and a kind of poo bear interior so they've got the blood the, the girl's sad, but there's a bit of fluff floating around as well. And there's actually a moment in the film, if you watch carefully, when he is hit by... So I'm allowed to tell this, honor because the spoilers are done. Um, oh, yes. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> he's After he's been hit by the car and he's slumped over it, you will see um, Christopher goes to uh, save Maria and then he coughs. And when he coughs, if you look carefully, fluff's coming out. So it's blood and fluff, which is he's throwing up on the uh, bonnet. <laughs> it's very subtle, like but I thought, I thought it'd be fun. What are their limitations in terms of Pooh and Piglet? Like in, in terms of their ability to survive, did you kind of like map out or create a maximum in terms of what they could withstand? And I don't know, maybe if Pooh's even immortal in a sense. <laughs> so yeah, Pooh is... A bit of a juggernaut like you can see he goes the amount he goes through gets hit by a car um, and even that only creates a bit of a limp on his leg for a moment so he's very very difficult to stop and i'm going to flesh out more how difficult he is to uh to to hold off in the sequel i think so piglet you can see was a bit bit easier to uh to take control of <laughs> so, so piglet is dead 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 in your no, in your piglet, eyes Piglet's not dead piglet's not dead no okay i you got. You can't, I was gonna. <laughs> yeah, you can't kill Piglet. He's um, him and Pooh are kind of the the original two, and I'm then in the sequel going to add a few more characters in with them. So they're going to go around and they'll be as a group killing people. How about their powers? So we see that Pooh can control bees. Did you ever develop a, like a similar type of power that maybe Piglet could have had? So Piglet, I tried to give them all differing weapons. So. Piglet always had like he walks around and he loves his sledgehammer and um, he's always got the chains around him as well and he loves to like when he ties up the girl he like hog ties her and I thought that was a nice link to him being a, a pig um, but he hasn't got a kind of at the moment or at least in the first one we didn't really establish a power with him with Pooh obviously there's that moment where he's controlling bees and I thought the whole bee dynamic was really interesting just to put in there and see what people thought about it you know I can remove it in the second one if people don't like it but um, there's a lot of points throughout the film where you'll notice little bees are flying around or they're um, sort of placed in certain areas so one particular example is uh, when Natasha's in the jacuzzi and she's enjoying herself there's a little bee which flies in and then it flies off it's basically scouted out the area for Pooh, found her, told, and then gone back and told Pooh and said, Natasha's in the jacuzzi. 
go and get her. <laughs> and, then, and then shortly after, Pooh appears. So they're kind of like they're, they're kind of like his scouts. But then at the end, there's that moment where he obviously controls a swarm of them. So, which I hope people get. Someone told me they thought it was dust, and I thought that made no sense. <laughs> it's, meant to, it's meant to be bees. <laughs> I didn't even need a swarm. I needed one bee and I'd be able to see it. And I think it's because that that's like my one big irrational fear is bees. So all I need to hear is the slightest buzz or think I caught a glimpse of one and I, I've got it and my mind goes down that path. <laughs> how about in terms of their end goal? Like I, I understand how Christopher Robin put them on this path, but do they have an end goal in mind or is it more so just like, killing for the sake of killing out out of out of anger and and heartbreak i guess so for Pooh, the the it's kind of christopher's always been the one he's kind of struggled to um really get to the point of killing and you can really see that in the torture scene like he's he's hitting him he'll cause him pain but he never goes to that that level um or to that extreme so i've kind of imagined his um like his his motive behind all of this is to essentially cause Christopher as much heartache and agony as he can, which is why he's really brutal to him at points. And you can see, you know, when he's torturing and what he does to his his like engaged wife, he then showers him in blood. He then whips him, and then at the end with the girl uh, with Maria, as they're having their intimate moment, he just wants to kill her in front of him. He's trying to cause a lot of suffering to Christopher, and that's what's going to be fleshed out more in the second. <laughs> All right. So bringing up the, the second film and I'll, I'll wind down here. I read a, a quote from Scott somewhere and it was something to the effect of like, if you do something and it works and it works well, don't change it. But I've also read that you guys are going to have five times the budget on the sequel. So why did a Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey sequel demand that kind of change, even though what you had worked? So it was really challenging what we had on the on the first one. I don't think many people will kind of believe how yeah how how little budget we had to work with. Um, and the thing is, is we, I feel I feel like we've done really 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 well, and so does the crew and cast and a lot of people relative to what we had. And I know like when it goes up more, it will really open up a lot more um, a lot of other possibilities for me because when I'm writing it, I'm coming up with these death scenes. I'm, I've always got, because I've got a bit of a producer's hat on, so I'm a bit kind of mindful of the budget and I'm like, okay, I need to limit it to this sort of area. But then when it becomes a lot larger, those possibilities expand more and now I can do a lot more fun deaths and we can have more deaths, we can do crazier things and just make it even more more entertaining. <laughs> okay, so sign me up for that. I'll I'll end with this one here because you just mentioned that like people will not believe how little you had to work with to pull this all off. Can you pinpoint one specific thing in the movie that on the day of filming even made you guys go like, I, I don't think we could do this with with the small amount of resources that we have, but you found a creative way to to tackle it and you did it. Yeah, there was um there was one scene I really wanted to do, and that was having Pooh climbing on the car. Um, and I wanted him to like be holding onto the back of the car, getting driven around. And they say, as the girls are trying to drive off, like Mary and Jessica, and you know he's making his way up and he's trying to break into the windscreens. And everyone was telling me on the like the days before, you can't do it. Like you know we don't have the money. There's there's not really a way. And then I was I was telling them, no, we can just poor man's process it which basically means the car is completely stationary and you have the people in the car but everyone kind of rocks it you add some smoke in and make the smoke blow past so it looks like it's moving and you just frame out the stuff around and that's exactly what we did so all of that scene bar one shot is completely stationary and it, I think it works really well it's like one of the like it's one of my favorite little bits of it <laughs> It's very impressive. Before I let you go, I'll just shout out also the lighting in this movie at points is just like it's stunning. You have some especially beautiful frames where the light is positioned just in the perfect spot and it makes for it makes for like a print it out and hang it up on the wall kind of frame. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, I'll give a big shout out to my uh, director of photography then. That's uh, that's Vince Knight. And yeah, we've worked with him on many films now. And yeah, he's absolutely amazing. So, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs>
All right. Well, I I mean, this is like the exciting thing about a movie like this. I could talk about it all day. It's just fun to like think about and to theorize where things could go from here. So huge congratulations. And I cannot wait to see the next chapter for Pooh and Piglet and whoever else you add to this film. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks for your time. 